afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a technical deep dive into service mesh networking. The session today is going to be in four parts. Act one, service mesh networking, in which I'll provide an overview of the service mesh and describe the role which the Envoy proxy plays in the service mesh data plane. In part two, my colleague Arun will talk about Google's managed control plane for the service mesh, traffic director. This was mentioned in the keynotes yesterday and at a fantastic session by Projector, which I recommend watching on YouTube if you haven't. Finally, Larry Peterson, CTO of Open Networking Foundation, will describe some novel use cases for the service mesh at L2 and L3, where in the telecommunications industry, the service mesh uh, concepts have been applied. Finally, we'll wrap up with some Q&A. By way of introduction, I'm Harvey Tuch. I'm a Googler. I work on Envoy platform issues at Google. I'm also an open source contributor in Envoy and a maintainer, and I'm super passionate about Envoy and its role in the service mesh. Why do we care about the service mesh and Envoy? Part of this is driven by this move towards microservices. This is uh, pretty uncontroversial, this industry-wide shift that's undergoing right now from you know, managing your applications like pets to cattle, or in the case of this slide, an adorable basket full of puppies. And uh, you know, this has brought huge uh, wins for development velocity, orchestration, uh, 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 making our systems more dynamic. But on the other hand, uh, there is a perceived uh, an actual cost in terms of complexity at ne uh, the networking level. Enter the service mesh. In the service mesh, we abstract away all this network plumbing and um, the nuts and bolts, and instead we start reasoning at the granularity of applications and microservices. We think in terms of application security, service discovery and observability. How does this uh, work? Well, one common uh, topology for the service mesh is the sidecar proxy. We inject into a container running alongside the applications an additional process, a binary, which uh, is essentially the gateway to the service mesh for that application. It contains all this, uh, these sort of network function goodies that are required to participate in the service mesh, from service discovery to authentication, authorization, rate limiting, uh, tracing, and so on. All these uh, network functions are factored out of the individual applications so that they don't need to be re-implemented uh, multiple times in each uh, different language or a framework or a microservice that you might be writing. There are alternative topologies. We won't talk too much about them today, but just to give you an idea, um, you could also imagine running a, a library which contains this functionality, and this is typified by gRPC LB, which is a fantastic example of client uh, side look aside load balancing, where instead of hopping through an additional process, you say remain in process and you use um, your RPC library is essentially uh, your gateway to the service mesh. This has advantages in terms of orchestration and reduced uh, performance overhead. Another example alternative in service mesh uh, that is uh, sometimes seen is uh, the middle proxy uh, configuration in which legacy applications in brownfield deployments uh, are bridged to the service mesh via an external proxy. They may not be running in containers. You can't relink these against some uh, library to provide the service mesh capabilities. Envoy is uh, the leading open source service mesh proxy. It runs as a sidecar proxy, as we saw a few slides ago. And we're going to I'll just dive into some of the details of what Envoy is about. So a, a good starting place is what is Envoy concretely? And if we look at its uh, architecture and its design philosophy, it's a code base built for performance, predictability, and low overhead. It's written in C++. Uh, it's a mid-sized project. It's designed, it's written in such a low-level language because we care about things like tail latency and minimizing overhead on the fast path in the data plane. We care about reducing memory consumption when running in a Docker environment. We also care about security and reliability. Being in a low-level language, it's also vital that you then apply best practices when it comes to software engineering. We have incredibly high test coverage, um, a developer community which has borrowed best practices from companies like Google, Lyft, and the industry to uh, produce reliable and stable and secure software. 
Envoy is not just a proxy, and in a few slides time, I'm gonna talk about Envoy's role as a platform, so keep that in mind. Um, it does have a bunch of sort of uh, goodies built into it, including advanced load balancing and health checking algorithms, support for modern protocols first, so it doesn't have too much uh, legacy craft from ancient network protocols, and it integrates well with other folks in, and players in the service mesh infrastructure space, uh, systems such as Prometheus or Datadog or Zipkin. So we've covered like what Envoy is, and then the question is like, who is Envoy? Uh, what is this community? Who's behind it? Who uses Envoy in production? This slide um, sort of captures some of the contributions to Envoy at Head of Tree by a uh, number of lines of code. Envoy's provenance is Lyft. It was created by the project founder Matt Klein at Lyft to solve the service mesh networking needs of Lyft. And it was open sourced roughly two and a half years ago. Since then, there's been a significant uptake in interest, in particular from Google and this long tail of developers. Google's the green uh, bar you can see here, that's the second from the left, lifts the pink. And there's a huge number of companies which make our community so awesome today. The, they've uh, uh, contributed all kinds of integrations and improvements to the core Envoy proxy. These are, uh, you know, traditional enterprise companies, they're um, SaaS providers, and they're startups. If we look here at just like the lines of code over time, uh, clearly Envoy's become much larger, but it's also become much more diverse in terms of its contributors. We uh, start on the left back in the end of 2016 with just Lyft in that sea of pink. In the 2017, in the middle, you can see Google and Lyft were the main contributors on the right. The community is now pretty well balanced between this long tail of the rest of the community, Google and Lyft. Envoy is used much more widely in production than just its development community, though. You can see here some familiar brand names you'll find on the Envoy landing page for folks who are running Envoy in production and are uh, proud to say so. There's also a huge number of other folks who are using Envoy um, in these kinds of roles, for, for example, SaaS or cloud infrastructure providers or cloud service providers uh, who um, might be using it either directly or who might be using it because Envoy is embedded in other products. Envoy is, for example, ships with Istio, and anyone using Istio is by virtue using Envoy. Why has Envoy been so successful and uh, been used so widely? Well, part of this is because Envoy is a platform. It's versatile, it can meet the needs of uh, various use cases and be reconfigured as needed it be. This platform-like nature arises from two aspects of Envoy. First, it's control plane, which is uh, built around a set of open gRPC-based protocols called XDS, allowing Envoy to integrate first with well-known control planes like Istio and Traffic Director, but also with um, you know, custom in-house network infrastructure that might need uh, in, in, uh, Envoy to fit within the, its existing um, configuration pipeline. Envoy's data plane is also extensible. That is, all the traffic flowing through uh, Envoy can be interposed on by uh, extensions that you can write and that the community has written to add in all kinds of functionality. This slide lists about uh, roughly a, a dozen or so uh, plus extensions that exist today in Envoy. These range from the meat and potatoes of its TCP and HTTP filters. These uh, filters provide uh, the ability to do things like transcoding between different protocols, let's say gRPC and JSON REST, or to apply additional control over the stream of traffic, for example, rate limiting or fault injection. There's also sort of advanced extension features for things like replacing transport security. We actually have a current PR for introducing an extension point for hardware security modules. Envoy's extensions go beyond just the data plane. Its, data, its extensions can be, uh, exist for things like monitoring, so you can integrate with pretty much any monitoring system that exists. Envoy also ships with batteries included, so it already has integrations with many of the uh, systems that you might care about, for example, Prometheus. Today, extensions are written in C++ primarily, and you statically link them against the Envoy binary, but uh, there's actually a very promising trend which we're seeing right now in which uh, extensions are being authored in dynamic languages like Lua and injected at runtime to Envoy via the control plane. This makes Envoy a programmable data plane. 
And in the future, we anticipate that WebAssembly support will arrive and we'll be able to basically write extensions in any language that you want and deliver it dynamically to a running Envoy process. Its control plane is built around this alphabet soup of protocols, which we call XDS. These sub-protocols allow things like service discovery, load balancing assignments, load reporting, delivery of route configuration, health checks, and so on. They're canonically defined and built around gRPC streaming and protocol buffers, though we have REST and YAML and JSON variants for folks who prefer those technologies. They have a range of consistency models depending upon the use case and how your control plane and management servers are configured. We view these protocols, though, as not just being Envoy's control plane, but being a sort of a lingua franca for network proxies in general. That is that they're the universal data plane API for L4 and L7. Once you have a set of uh, an ecosystem, a set of management servers and control plane, which is capable of running Envoys, you can run pretty much anything that implements these APIs. This might include, for example, gRPCLB, which is adopting the XDS APIs for client look-aside load balancing for those client LB service meshes. It could include in the future things like hardware load balancers or other software proxies, which choose to adopt the Envoy APIs. And there's an active effort right now in the community on uh, making these APIs um, uh, structured and versioned appropriately to uh, enable uh, splitting off concerns which are specific to Envoy from their universal nature. Another way to conceptualize this is that this is really the uh, analogy of OpenFlow or P4 for L4 and L7. Uh, so just as you know, with OpenFlow, you can uh, reconfigure, uh, let's say, IP routing um, via an OpenFlow controller. Uh, with, with the SDN, you can do the same with Envoy and its data plane uh, via XDS. I'd like to just finish off briefly by touching on uh, the relationship between Envoy and Istio. This is one of the most famous associations uh, between, uh, that, that exists for Envoy, and it functions pretty much as a standard sidecar proxy. This is also an interesting case study in Envoy's extensibility. First, it's uh, managed by the uh, Istio control plane uh, called Pilot over the, the XDS protocols. And it also features a number uh, of uh, specific Istio extensions that are linked against the Envoy binary to allow it to, at runtime, interpose all network traffic and funnel them to, via RPCs to the mixer service, uh, which is part of the Istio runtime. And there they can enforce additional policy checks and logging and telemetry and so on. Many folks are comfortable running Envoy themselves, uh, in particular sophisticated users um, who need to use it in very custom applications, uh, and Istio as well. Other folks would prefer that their Envoys and Istio uh, service mesh uh, control planes be managed, because these are, and I think the, this really like leads into Traffic Director, which is Google's managed control plane for both Envoy and Istio. So my colleague Arun is going to talk a bit more about uh, uh, Traffic Director now, so I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Arun. Thanks, Harvey. Um, I'm Arun, a software engineer at Google. So Harvey talked about, uh, Harvey talked about uh, Envoy and Data Plane and uh, XDS API as uh, Universal Data Plane API. The XDS API is often coupled with a sophisticated control plane uh, to drastically reduce the operational complexity of uh, deployments. Um, in that context, I would like to introduce uh, Traffic Director, uh, which is a globally deployed, fully GCP-managed uh, XDS server control plane to serve uh, XDS-compliant clients uh, like Envoy. Um, Traffic Director serves network policies and globally load balanced and centrally health checked endpoints to the XDS client via the XDS API. For global load balancing, Traffic Director has a, a full view of uh, the load originating from every GCP zone and the capacity available in every GCP zone for the service deployed. And with that uh, knowledge and information, Traffic Director has the ability to route clients to the closest zones with capacity. Um, and the proximity is uh, measured based on network latencies. And when the uh, region is at capacity, or if there are failures in the region, a traffic director has the ability to route clients to the closest zones in 
the adjacent uh, regions uh, or nearby regions. Uh, the load information and the capacity information and traffic directors uh, fed into uh, Autoscaler as well. So uh, this allows Autoscaler to do a traffic demand-driven autoscaling. And as Autoscaler uh, scales up the instances, the traffic director in the interim has the ability to route client requests to uh, nearby zones, uh, thereby efficiently serving the service while the Autoscaler scales up the instances. Um, Traffic director also performs uh, centralized health checking. Um, so this eliminates the need for every client in the network to health check every other backend. So we call it as n square health checking, and this could be a significant uh, source of uh, network traffic in your deployment. Uh, finally, uh, the XGS APIs are served by traffic director uh, via Google frontend. This is the same frontend that is used to serve other major Google services like you know, Gmail, or, um, Search, and such. So the Google uh, frontend has the intelligence to route the XGS client request to any traffic director instance globally that has capacity, and independent of which traffic director instance serves the request, the load balancing, the global load balancing for the client is always based on the client zone. Okay. So I want to dive a little a bit uh, deeper into the APA model for uh, the traffic director. Um, the GCP API data model is uh, the same as HTTPS LB. Uh, in fact, under the hood, Traffic Director uses the same uh, infrastructure as HTTPS LB for global load balancing and centralized health checking. So we have a new load balancing scheme called internal self-managed that helps uh, direct uh, configuration targeted for Traffic Director. The global forwarding rule can, in the context of Traffic Director can be thought of as a reference to a configuration for one entity. For example, uh, it may refer to a configuration of a Kubernetes service. And if the user wants to uh, create a mesh that is a combination of multiple configuration, the user can do that by combining multiple forwarding rule configs with the same VPC network name. So in some sense, the VPC network name acts as a logical identifier for the mesh name. The URL map. Uh, has the request routing rules and action pointing to the service represented by the backend service data model. The backends are added to the backend service. The backends could either be a VM represented by an instance group data model, or it could be the container IP ports represented by a data model called network endpoint groups. Uh, in orchestrated deployments like Kubernetes and GKE, uh, as the endpoints get scheduled, as the pods get scheduled, the network endpoint, the, a controller called NEC controller is responsible for keeping the network endpoint group updated so that the backend service has the proper reflection of endpoints to service mapping. So this allows traffic director to homogeneously manage uh, the VM and uh, the container uh, deployments. Okay. So, so far we talked about the traffic director beta features. So now I'd like to uh, introduce traffic directors, uh, traffic control, features that are uh, alpha. Uh, traffic control is uh, a set of features that uh, uh, helps you control the flow of traffic in your deployment. Um, uh, you, you could set, uh, it allows you to specify uh, matching uh, rules for your incoming request. and allows you to set up actions for the matched request. And then at a service level, per service, it allows you to set uh, traffic policies that uh, helps in traffic shaping and traffic routing the incoming request to your target destination service. Um, not necessarily uh, related to traffic control, but as the number of configurations grow, there may be need to uh, test your configuration through a test pool of Envoys, or perhaps your mesh has uh, Envoys of different config scope, and in such cases you can potentially use a, a configuration filtering option where you can target the configuration to a subset of Envoys identified through their metadata. Okay, so let me dive a little deeper into each of uh, these uh, features. Uh, for uh, request matching, for a set of rules to specify on what to match for the incoming request, you can set up a host match, you can set up uh, a path match, um, uh, and, and there are variants like prefix match, suffix match, and regular expressions, and so on. Or you can set up uh, uh, matches based on anything in your header, like you know, cookies, user agents, and so on. And once a match is found, you can perform 
uh, certain actions on the match request. The standard actions are redirects, rewrites, header transforms, um, or sending the traffic to a particular service. But I want to talk about a few interesting use cases in the actions. Um, so let's say you have a binary that you want a canary, or you have a monolithic binary and you are starting to um, have container modernize your application by containerizing it and going to a microservice model. You can use an action or traffic action called traffic splitting, where you can set up a small percentage of traffic to go to your new deployment or the new binary. And over time, as you qualify the binary, as you get more confidence, you can send more and more traffic to the new binary, enabling a smooth transition. Um, so let's say you want to uh, uh, understand the resiliency, resiliency of your microservice when one of your core dependencies starts uh, responding with errors. Uh, you can set up an action called uh, fault injection, where you can uh, specify thresholds and type of errors that your service uh, would respond with. And using that, you can um, figure out you know, how your deployment behaves in the presence of those errors. Um, so we, uh, at, even at Google, we have uh, needs where we have testbed and testbed uh, service. And instead of using synthetic or simulated traffic, sometimes there is a need to uh, have production traffic and test out your you know, test binaries. You know, to do that, you can do something called traffic mirroring where you can uh, use uh, the traffic control features to set up traffic to be mirrored to a shadow service without impacting your production uh, deployments. And this shadow service could be your test service in your test bed, uh, helping to qualify your test binary with uh, production traffic. So we talked about the traffic director's uh, global load balancing. So the global load balancing helps uh, pick out a zone with uh, capacity. However, there may be needs for the user to set up more fine-grained load balancing schemes. So we allow a per-service load balancing configuration that influences how a backend is picked within a zone while the global load balancing picks out a zone with capacity. So that this uh, two-tiered load balancing enables you to um, have uh, options like you know, round robin or weighted round robin or um, affinity and such, and fine tune your load balancing schemes while still leveraging the global load balancing offered by Traffic Director. Okay, so onto the final slide. Um, so as a service owner, if you would want to uh, have a good control of uh, the volume of connections open from a client to your service, you can uh, set up something called uh, circuit breakers, which uh, uh, is a way to apply back pressure on the client and have the clients fail fast rather than overwhelm your clients, or sorry, overwhelm your backends. Um, oftentimes it takes a small amount of time for the control plane to turn around with a globally optimal decision. Uh, however, if you want a better resiliency in your data plane, where uh, if a particular backend instance goes down or a VM goes down, and if you want to respond to that quickly before the control plane can detect the uh, state of uh, or change in the health state of the backends. You can set up something called outlier detection, where uh, in the data plane um, you uh, identify unresponsive backends and evict those backends until the control plane turns around with a globally optimal uh, decision. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Larry, who's going to talk about an interesting mesh use case and modernization of telco infrastructure. I'm good, thank you. So, so now that you understand service meshes, I'm going to break it, or at least challenge it, uh, with a different use case, which is the telco use case. So you need to have a picture in your head, which is that it's a multi-cloud world, and of course we know there are a lot of data center public clouds. You probably also know that there are intermediate clouds. They they live in IX. Uh, it, it, they live within the telcos. They live in internet exchange points. And the current push, as I'm sure you're aware, if you've been following the hype, is towards the edge. So the question is, how? What is exactly going to happen here as we get out to the edge? And how are we going to do service meshes across this entire thing? Now, this particular picture is a little bit aspirational. Uh, because it shows a, a really nice, clean edge. The, the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of legacy hardware at the edge right now. Now, of course, it depends on whose edge we're talking about, but I'm going to talk about the telco edge for a minute. 
So these are the central offices of the telco. It's the head ends of the cable companies. And if you were ever to go inside of one of those, you'd think you had walked into a museum because it's full of hardware that goes back many, many years. As long as it's generating money, they keep it running. Uh, you might find 300 different kinds of hardware devices inside of a telco central office. And so it's clearly in, this, in the telco's best interest to try to modernize that, that infrastructure. And so what they've been doing is they've been trying to commoditize, virtualize, and disaggregate the access network. And by access network, I'm talking about the cellular network and the fiber to the home, the passive optical networks. And so they're working hard at this. They, they basically are trying to adopt the same technology that's back in the public cloud and apply it to these edges full of these specialized devices. There's a project at the ONF that we're involved with called CORD, uh, which is an umbrella, but it also is a particular implementation, which is an acronym for central office re-architected as a data center. But the idea is to take those commodity, virtualized type technologies and bring them to the edge. And so that's well in progress. A lot of disaggregation has happened. It's being put back together again. And that does, in fact, get us to the point that I'm going to call this thing the access edge, because it's a point where traditional, conventional cloud technology and access technology coexists. And so that's the, this is called the access edge. Now, of course, from a telco point of view, they're interested in offering services to subscribers. So we have to think at a little bit finer granularity every now and then in terms not of a service mesh, but as a service chain. And in the near future, that service chain is going to be distributed across the access edge, some intermediate telco clouds or internet exchange points all the way back up into the data center. And it will, in fact, go onto the premises as well. So there will be an on-premises aspect to the, to the edges in addition to the access edge. But one of the unique things about the access network is that it also supports mobility. And so these service chains need to be able to migrate from one edge to another, which as you move functionality closer to the edges means that that functionality has to move as well. So if you pull back for a second and think about the earlier generations of the, of the cellular network, 2G, 4G, and 4, 2, 4G, it's basically mobility of the broadband access, but now if we're going to move functionality to the edge, we have to move the functions as well. That doesn't mean VM migration, but somehow I have to support the fact that you had something running on your behalf at one edge, and it may now need to run another edge. So in effect, the cloud becomes mobile as well as, as the broadband connectivity. <clears throat> so this is the big picture of what the telco world is after, and that is to be part of, the, part of this end-to-end -end cloud uh, environment. So they had to start from the beginning. You all know microservices because you've been breaking your monolithic applications down for a long time. The telco industry is just now trying to do that. So I wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about that because it's after you break it down that you get to put it back together in, in a service mesh. Well, so these, like I said, these central offices are full of proprietary, closed, bundled hardware. And it's another uh, alphabet soup. And if you know any of these, good for you. But in the access networks, we've got PONs and RANs and E-node e Bs and BNGs and so on. It's not important what those all are. It's the, it's the various boxes. And again, they're monolithic closed uh, pieces of hardware. And they're being disaggregated. And so part of that disaggregation is to split the control plane from the data plane. This is standard SDN practices. Part of it is to break the monolithic pieces of code into microservices. So that's what the rest of the cloud industry is doing. But the other thing that's kind of interesting here is because first and foremost, there are communication services running. Sometimes you want to take those microservices and drop them down into the switching fabric. And so because the data plane in, in modern white box switches is also programmable, I can take what used to run in a microservice and move it down in, into the forwarding plane. Now we're talking the hardware forwarding plane. So these are all aspects of disaggregation. Okay, it's not just microservices, it's programming the forwarding plane in the, in the switches as well. Well, let me just try to make it slightly more concrete. So this is now a service mesh. This, without going through the details of how you break down any particular bit of hardware, this is a service mesh for the cellular use case. And again, there's a bunch of acronyms. What's important about the color coding here is that everything in blue is a function that's implemented in the switching fabric. Everything that's red is a function that's implemented in a, in a container, in a microservice. Uh, the solid lines are data paths. Packets actually flow over on behalf of end subscribers. The dotted lines are control, control paths. And this is clearly an, an opportunity to bring traditional service mesh 
technology to bear so we could run Envoy on the video archive and the CDN out at the edge. The other thing to note is that this is, in fact, also multi-cloud. So bits and pieces of it, and they, could, they can be configured in different ways, but bits and pieces of it here will, in fact, run at the access edge, and pieces of it will run back in, in perhaps, uh, commodity cloud. So this is a configuration that we've been working on uh, in conjunction with the service mesh world and, and the ONF to try to demonstrate this in the cellular case. Oh, and by the way, this is just representative in the, in the sense that we assume there will be other edge services. And by the way, those edge services are the ones that need high bandwidth, low latency, and deal with a scalable number of Internet of Things or whatever autonomous vehicles are out there at the edge. And there will, of course, be multiple cloud services running back in the data center as well. Okay, so we've blown these things into bits. Now we have to put them back together again. And this is where something like a service mesh is an important uh, tool. But operationalizing this disaggregated system is a little bit different than simply connecting together a bunch of microservices because there are other elements in here. So I wanted to walk through that for just a few minutes. So I think of this as the disruptor's dilemma, and this is in fact the critical problem that the telco industry is facing right now. On the one hand, they wanted to disaggregate everything because that's what spurs innovation. I've got smaller pieces, it's not tightly bundled and controlled by the vendors. That's, that is in fact the value proposition of open networking and SDN. On the other hand, you can't deploy a bunch of disaggregated components. You have, to, you have to integrate them back together again. Now, in the telco world, because what they're used to doing is dropping in these bundled solutions, they have a certain mindset as to how that integration happens. But basically, they take the disaggregated components and they repackage them until they're a monolithic solution again. And then that's what they're prepared to drop in. But that kind of defeats the purpose. You're not, you're not doing continuous integration of the individual components if you, if you fall back to that kind of hard-coded integration. And so what, what the key focus here is that they also automate the, the integration process. And so that involves a declarative intent. I basically, and this is very much in the spirit of service meshes, I want to lift the operator parameter, operational parameters out of the services and up into a service control plane, leaving behind the implementation of the service uh, proper. So I separate the development concerns for the operational deployment concerns. I want to avoid those hard-coded dependencies between the, the, the pieces that I've just carved off. Second, and consistent with that, I want a centralized authority. I don't want to have to go touch 80 pieces of code every time I make a change. I want to centrally declare this is my intent and then make it so everywhere else. Otherwise, I'm, just, I'm going to end up, instead of managing 300, I'm going to be managing 30,000 different microservices and, and uh, uh, disaggregated components in the central offices, and that's not a good place to be. The third point is we have to be implementation agnostic. And this is, the, this is really critical because it's not just microservices. There's going to be functionality implemented in brownfield hardware devices for some time. There are going to be functions implemented in virtual machines. There are going to be microservices, and there's going to be functions that are implemented in the switching fabric. And so we can't bake assumptions into our service control plane about where things are implemented. So the solution that we have come to as of now and what we're deploying in uh, trials within the major carriers that are partners of, of the ONF, just a, two, two, two words about the ONF, our partners are our network operators, and that's a broadly defined term. Google's a member, AT&T, Comcast, Deutsche Telekom, and so on. So the ones that want to see this happen and the set of vendors that are supporting them to try to make it happen. But in that setting, we, we are putting together solutions, and we have a service control plane. It's called XOS. And the important thing to take away from it is that it's basically managing a, a service data plane that has a, a, a collection of different disaggregated components that it's managing. Some of those are legacy virtual network functions running in VMs. Some of them are horizontally scalable microservices, and some of them are SDN control apps, and others are possible as well. They could have been legacy SaaS, for that matter. And in a very declarative way, you tell, you give XOS a schema that says, this is how I want all of these parts glued together in a logical space, make it so down on the data plane. So it's a very consistent model with what happens with service meshes. Now, having posited that, let's step back for a second, and hopefully you've, you recognize the parallels here. It's the same story, different level. And so the parallels are at L7, uh, we have a programmable data plane. It's programmed in proxies. In L2, L3, it's programming ASICs in, in, the, in the switches. 
Uh, we have an API, it's XDS in the L7 case. It's either OpenFlow or P4 runtime. Both, are, both happen in the, in the uh, cord case. In the control plane, we have something like Istio. In the uh, cord case, we have something like Onos, which is an open network operating system. So think of whatever your favorite SDN controller is and substitute it there. By the way, you'll notice I left out L4. Uh, L4 could be solved in either one of those. I didn't want to put it in either one as, as the absolute right answer, uh, but L4 is clearly where the two, where the two meet. So if you, if you apply that basic mapping of the world uh, back onto where we are with uh, uh, the service mesh, you find an obvious parallel between Onos and Istio. And uh, Envoy is a way of programming the data plane in the same way that we can use P4, P4 runtime to program the switching, the switching fabric and therefore affect the data plane. Uh, now, that kind of leaves us in a little bit of a struggle as to what we call these things because I've just added an extra level here. So this is a, con this is a control plane. Does that make this the management plane? That is certainly one interpretation, but the interpretation that I prefer is to say that we have a network control plane and we have a service control plane. And the difference is perhaps subtle, but perhaps important, which is at the service level, we do also keep track of state for the services that are inside of the, the gray boxes at the bottom. And that's really critical because we're not just managing uh, a set of microservices, we're managing the functionality on behalf of subscribers. And this actually gets us to one of the challenging problems in the telco case, which I think has some applicability to, these, to service messes in general, which is that if this were a service mesh, and it's just an arbitrary one, except again, I've color coded it so that there are microservice-based services and there are switch-based services, then I have, on behalf of different subscribers or classes of subscribers, something called a service chain, which is an, alloc an instance of each one of those services, let's assume they are multi-tenant services, on behalf of a particular subscriber that gives me a path through the service mesh on behalf of that particular subscriber, and I have another service chain, perhaps it's different, that runs on behalf of another subscriber. So in the networking world, this is sometimes, or in the access network world, this is sometimes called network slicing, but I can give you some guaranteed service and I can give you customized functionality on, on, on a subscriber by subscriber basis or perhaps on a subscriber class by subscriber class basis. This is really critical for monetizing uh, the edge, as you might imagine is a pretty important thing. But as we roll out, as the telcos roll out 5G, the ability to control at that kind of granularity and not only provide control at that granularity, but also diagnostics at that granularity and troubleshooting at that granularity is a critical requirement. So managing runtime workflows, it's not just about configuration parameters. It's not just saying, here's how I want you to behave, go for it. It's, it's, it's a runtime operation as well. So the key takeaways. First of all, the access network is being cloudified. It is being reduced to commodity software virtualization disaggregation. Um, the integration challenge is the hard one, and that's the same, that's the same challenge that service meshes are, are targeted at. Some of the specifics are a little bit different, but at the end of the day, these service meshes, I believe, will span both access networks on-premises and back into the public cloud. The second big point is that access networks will be part of the multi-cloud. There's a really, really interesting question here as to who's going to own the edge. And in fact, if you look at the, at the, the two uh, count, counter uh, industries here in terms of the cloud, clearly moving towards the edge, in terms of the, uh, the incumbent service providers already at the edge with the footprint in the central offices, they're clearly trying to turn that into a small edge cloud and move back upstream. So there is a collision course happening here. I have no idea how the dust is going to settle, but I do believe access technology is going to be at a critical part of that future multi-cloud because it's going to be a critical part of the edge. And that's simply because of the, the capabilities that 5G will eventually bring us. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, value that's potential there above and beyond just thinking everything at the edge is going to be Wi-Fi. That's actually, uh, the sub points get into that. This is certainly going to be part of the telco infrastructure, but I think it's more importantly also going to be democratized and part of the on-premises infrastructure at the same time. There's, there is uh, unlicensed band that's going to be available for 5G. 
uh, in the U.S. and it's starting to happen in Europe, uh, putting, these into manu putting these capabilities into manufacturing pa plants, parking lots, and any, uh, anytime you try to automate drones or whatever, that's going to be a critical part of it. As a, uh, and therefore, it's this and it's because of this intrinsic support for mobility, low latency, and scalable number of edge devices that this is going to be critical. The final bullet then is, I do believe that service meshes will be the unifying abstraction. Uh, we already are making good progress in two different settings. The telco one is, is, is a slightly different one and a slightly newer one, but I think it's, it's going to, these are going to merge. Uh, we clearly need to model services and not just service and be agnostic about the service implementation. When I say service in this room, you immediately probably think Kubernetes service, but we have to think more broadly than that. Second, support for fine grain workflows at runtime is going to be a critical requirement, and there are clearly parallels between what we're doing at L3, L2, L3, and L7. We need to figure out I think, in fact, it probably comes back to what is the language with which, or the API with which I, I control this, the, the data plane, no matter what level I'm at. Because we're going to find that functionality moving up and down the stack for performance reasons and for generality reasons all the time, and that's where we need to, to get ourselves to.